Chapter 5 brings us to the first 60 minutes of a traffic scene response. We're going to discuss again some of the effects of SOPs and SOGs. We will discuss the actions that must happen at a highway scene to ensure safety, and we will discuss personal safety measures to be taken while working in traffic. It's also essential that we understand the responsibilities of emergency responders at highway incidents and the risks associated with closing down traffic lanes. One of the first safety measures we will implement with our response is safe positioning of our emergency vehicles. The first emergency vehicle that arrives at an incident scene is responsible for positioning their vehicle as a block. The number of lanes that need to be blocked will vary based on the circumstances of the incident. Note that multi-lane blocking would include blocking one lane and the shoulder. Blocking creates a barrier between traffic and the incident scene where responders are working. Now this slide shows the difference between linear and multi-lane blocking. With linear blocking, we are blocking in a straight line in one lane. With the multi-lane blocking, we are blocking a lane in a shoulder. This might be necessary when the incident occurred in part of a lane and vehicles cannot be moved. In addition, there are two ways a vehicle can be positioned on the roadway. Angled, meaning the vehicle is positioned at an angle with respect to the travel lanes, or parallel, meaning the vehicle is positioned in a parallel with the travel lanes. Now when positioning a vehicle, considerations should also be given to angling the vehicle in whichever direction it is desired for traffic to move or transition, since the direction of the vehicle can provide a visual cue to motorists regarding the direction in which they should move. Here we have an example of a fire truck that is using an angled, multi-lane blocking position. Note that while it is necessary for law enforcement and EMS vehicles to employ block positioning strategies, if they are the first to arrive at the incident, large, heavy fire apparatuses provide a better block. Furthermore, the ideal blocking vehicle is one that is equipped with a truck-mounted attenuator. In general, these vehicles are deployed by highway departments and typically only respond to intermediate or major incidents. Depending on the circumstances of the incident, emergency vehicles may be parked in a block left, which is anchored left towards the median or center line, a block right, anchored right towards the outside shoulder. One factor to consider when deciding between a left or a right block is whether it will be necessary to access the equipment from the vehicles or, in the case of a fire apparatus, the pump panel. In these cases, position the vehicle on the opposite side of ongoing traffic. An ambulance should be positioned with the loading zone away from moving traffic. When positioning the responder vehicle, you should always work on the assumption that the unit will be hit by oncoming traffic. Therefore, it is considered optimal to turn wheels so that they are not facing the incident space. In the event that a responder vehicle is struck, the wheel angle being positioned away from the work area will lessen the likelihood that that vehicle is pushed into the area where responders are working. This type of wheel positioning is referred to as the critical wheel angle. So every block creates an area of danger at the space between the furthermost point of the angle, usually at the front left or the front right of the vehicle, and the area where traffic passes. This area is referred to as the zero buffer. If you have to pass through the zero buffer zone, stop, check for traffic, and then proceed along the unit remaining as close to the emergency vehicle as possible. So can you spot the zero buffer zone in this scene? Now, oftentimes, to ensure responder and motorist safety, it is necessary to close additional lanes for portions of the incident. A good rule of thumb is to take only as many lanes as you need for only as long as you need them. A typical incident will have at least one lane or the shoulder obstructed upon arrival, and under some circumstances, it may be necessary to close another lane initially, even if the incident is not directly obstructing it. This protocol, where one additional lane is blocked in order to increase safety, is referred to as lane or lanes plus one blocking. Use of the lane plus one blocking protocol creates an adequate buffer against moving traffic for responders. 
Now the purpose of lane plus one blocking is to provide responders working at an incident scene a protected workspace where they can do their job safely. Fire and EMS personnel need room to work during patient treatment and patient movement so they can focus on the patient and not be focused on avoiding moving traffic. Once the patient is loaded, vehicle positioning should be assessed to determine if one extra lane can be opened. Now, due to the potential of exploding projectiles and visibility concerns related to smoke, vehicle fires typically require lane plus one blocking. Remember to use your critical wheel angle to direct tires away from the incident workspace. It is best practice, if able, to have a safety officer assigned for scene safety and traffic control. Now, if you recall our D drivers from previous chapters, drunk, drowsy, drugged, distracted, and just plain dumb, keep in mind that you can't ever become complacent and trust approaching traffic in either direction. Do not turn your back to them. Make sure you look before you move and plan an escape route so that you can jump out of the way if necessary. As in all scenes, it's important to not get tunnel vision and to keep your eye on the big picture. Also keep in mind weather and visibility as these things can affect drivers. By implementing personal safety measures, you can help keep the team safe by proactively keeping yourself safe. Be aware of your situation. Ensure you're wearing the required high visibility clothing and vest. Check your surroundings before jumping out of a vehicle and try to access your apparatus on the downstream side. Keep your eyes on the traffic while keeping a low profile. Limit your exposure, especially into a direct lane of traffic. Now remember, we're guarding the scene and guarding the crew. This scene is well marked with traffic control devices, lots of blocking vehicles, and what appears to be quite a large workspace. Don't forget to utilize your vehicle's features to check the roadway before you exit. Check mirrors or cameras if available to clear your area. Going back to the manual on uniform traffic control devices, section 6i.05 specifically covers the use of emergency vehicle lighting and states, the use of emergency vehicle lighting such as high intensity rotating, flashing, oscillating, or strobe light is essential, especially in the initial stages of a traffic incident for the safety of emergency responders and persons involved in the traffic incident as well as road users approaching the traffic incident. Emergency vehicle lighting, however, provides warning only and provides no effective traffic control. The use of too many lights at an incident scene can be distracting and can create confusion for approaching road users and other responders, especially at night. Road users approaching the traffic incident from the opposite direction are often distracted by emergency vehicle lighting and slow their vehicles to look at the traffic incident posing a hazard to themselves and others traveling in their direction. Being blinded by response vehicle lights also increases the amount of time it takes for a motorist to see response vehicles and then react and increases the likelihood for secondary crashes. Consider the stopping distance of an automobile is goal line to goal line, but at night the headlights only shine to the 50-yard line. Now when using emergency lighting, we need to realize this can become distracting to other drivers, specifically at night. We should consider turning off emergency lights of the, of the forward-facing vehicles so that we don't impair oncoming drivers. Now to support the recommendations set forth in the manual, agencies should also consider installing day slash night or high low power switches on LED and strobe bars. Now with that being said, we don't want our scenes to be under lighted. We can see an example of four scene lighting because there isn't much to see. We can see a few reflective bunker gears and a couple brake lights. The bottom example shows that traffic control devices are properly used, vehicles are well lit, but it doesn't seem overbearing or glaringly bright. Some best practice notes might be to use proper blocking with arrow signs. We also want to think about increasing the use of amber lighting as it seems more likely to slow traffic. We do need to provide sufficient scene illumination for responders and sometimes using law enforcement vehicles help slow traffic as drivers will often slow for police just by the reflex of seeing their lights. Now, although it is not ideal to close traffic altogether, sometimes it can be necessary. This is where advanced planning comes in handy.
We can have alternative traffic routes in mind and work together with other agencies to ensure a quick established detour and quick and safe scene clearance. By limiting the exposure of responders on a scene, this is a good way to prevent incident. If we limit the scene to the minimum responders and vehicles and only use the necessary amount of crews, we reduce scene congestion and confusion. Some other considerations are to use two-way radios to advise fellow responders of traffic conditions. Use caution when removing cones and warning signs as that puts you in front of traffic with less than the optimal number of traffic control devices. It is a good idea to use the safety officer during the scene takedown and try to clear crews from the scene as soon as possible. It's recommended to reduce blinding vehicle lighting, increase your awareness of oncoming traffic, as we've reiterated before, make sure you are wearing compliant high visibility vests and garments and utilizing the necessary traffic control devices to ensure you are positioning your vehicles safely. Although we want to reduce our impact on traffic as much as we can, we do want to create an adequately sized work zone. It's important that crews are properly trained to deploy and remove devices and that we are turning vehicle wheels away from the work area. To summarize, we want to resolve the incident as quickly as possible, implement and remove our traffic control devices safely, and be able to consider our own personal safety measures.